If it's like, yeah. hey, we're gonna start again. Go oh my days, I'll start again. We're gonna start again. See, this is why, Josh. This is why I said, Femi, you should do it because I don't know. Oh, what do it. You gotta learn. You gotta grow, bro. This is what I said. Hey, <laughs> I, I don't know if I Wait, I'll get, and and I'm gonna correct you. You said Siberia, Serbia. Hey, I'm talking about snus. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Look at you. That's <laughs> Siberian, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Serbia. I will it. Okay, cool. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the 92, the show that brings you up close and personal to the Banarama National League. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host Femi Lasamni, but this week we're joined by a formidable striker, played over 250 games, a football league striker in the past, also somebody who's played for a lot of teams in this league, notably Oldham, Dagenham and Willstone. He's played in Serbia, Scotland and Slovenia. We welcome Oxford City's Josh Parker. Welcome to the show. Thank you, my bros. It's a pleasure to be here. I've actually been, been keeping up to date. I've been keeping up to date on everything you do. Like it's very, very positive and very necessary. So commend the uh, flowers to yourselves. Ah, that's that's good. Good yeah. Yeah, what people what a lot of people don't know is that Josh was in my youth team. Yeah. So I've known Josh for a number of years and he's been balling for many, many years, you know. <laughs> You know what I think? Femi ain't aged as well, you know. That's what I, every time I see Femi, he looks the same, like literally, like <laughs> young at heart, young at heart. Man. Yeah, I'm still running around. I'm still trying to run around, man. But um, Andy, sorry to cut you off. Uh, Andrew's in our youth team as well. Oh, yeah, Angelo's in our youth team as well. That's interesting, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Josh, talk to me, man. You've had a great career, I'll be honest with you. Um, obviously, looking at our youth team, you're one of the ones that's went on and and really made something out of your career, you know what I mean? So credit to you on that, isn't it? Because there wasn't many of us. Um, you're obviously now in your 30s and you've landed back in the National League. Um, how, how have you found the National League so far? Um, Because it's, it's your first time, it's your first time here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first time, kind of second time. Like, so when I was at QPR, my first loan was to AFC okay. and they were in the conference prem. Um, I wasn't there for long. Because of my, you know my ways, Femi, I'm quite rebellious. Um, and I had a bit of an argument after such a short period and I was gone. Um, so yeah, this is my first proper spell in this league. But it's a lot better than people give it credit for. That's what I will say. Um, there's a lot of good players. Um, a lot of players that have mixed it at higher levels or are capable of playing at higher levels. Some play A lot of players are here for, um, for their by their own choice. Um, but it's a very good league, a very good league. Like, what I would say is back in the day, there used to be, from when I've watched it, a lot of teams that were just favourites because they had the most money, this and that. But now, when you see the results, anyone can beat anyone. It's almost like boxing. It's like the styles make the games. So that's what's interesting about it. But um, I, I'm enjoying it. I, I love the league. I think the league's so good. No, I, t I totally agree. Um, in the past, it's definitely a league where people drop down for the money. Like you said, now people are definitely coming here out of choice. Um, and Oxford City, talk to me about your season so far. Obviously, you've scored nine goals. It's been a bit up and down. You've, you've. It's, it seems like a bit of a roller coaster, similar to Barnwoods in terms of consistency. So, talk us a little bit about how your season's been after getting promotion from the National League South. Um, it's it's hard to break down because of the fact that our performances and how we play football is. In my opinion, I'd say we're top three footballing teams in the league. I would say that um, how we play football and how we go about playing football, I think is how everyone would like to play football. Um, but that doesn't win you games. Experience wins you games. Goals win you game. Um, not conceding wins you games. So that's been our problem a lot of the time. I think we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago and I think our average uh, possession 
uh, over the course of the season is like 65 to 70 percent that is it's really really high um but we'll like the game last week against york we'll make silly mistakes so dominating the game really dominating the game lots of chances not taking the chances concede last kick of the game you lose like uh, and that's i think you two will know when you're experienced it's the little man management and your team's very good at it when we played you guys managing the game slowing things down um speaking to the referee, going down, knowing how to kill a game when a team's on top. And you can't buy that stuff. You can't teach that stuff. It's just built into you. So I think that's where we've fallen short so far this season. But the one thing that I think works in our favour is um, we are now getting players back that uh, were really important to us because we do have a small squad and we have by far the smallest budget. We had the smallest budget in the league below last year. So um, we're doing well. But um, I think we now will start to kick on and start to pick up results. It's almost like when it gets desperate, you kind of realise the magnitude of the the situation and no one wants a relegation on their on their CV. That's for sure. Cool. You, said, you said a little deep stuff that I'm not even going to lie to you. Um, and you spoke about um, those silly mistakes and, and, and conceding late on. Um, I, know you're, you're, I, think, I think it's a little bit harsh because a lot of teams... A lot of teams in this division can see that if you look at the amount of goals yeah. that are scored in this division, it's in additional time, 90 plus. You know what I mean? And a lot of teams can see. It. So what do you what do you put that down to? Like what what, what would you pinpoint it down um, to? I would say it's naivety because last season we could get away with that stuff because it, even though we're dominant in possession in this league, um last season we knew that um we could get away with bringing the ball down in the box when you should clear it as a defender or all these little things that we sh like rush into a throw on when it's the 80th minute and we're one nil up. Like all these things that I mentioned before, um, it's naivety and probably lack of boys maybe playing at this level, um, lack of experience, which goes a long, long way in, in football, as you know. Um, I just think it's pure naivety and at some point in time, the penny's got to drop and you've got to realise this isn't um, fun and games. This is pro like professional football in my eyes now. When you get to this kind of level, it's professional now. Like it, it means something. For sure. For sure. No, I can hear the I can hear the frustration in your voice, and it's something that we probably echo. But I want to talk about um, your past and your journey. And you've had a lot of clubs in higher leagues. Um, as you said, there you started off at QPR. Um, use that AFC when you went on loan, but is there a moment that would define your career? Um, I would say there's a couple because obviously, when you get your debut or make your debut, it kind of that's the only moment that is I still have a high about. If you get what I mean, because you know they speak about gold medal syndrome. Like if you get promoted, it's amazing. Then the next day, it's almost back to reality. But when I made my debut at QPR, um, it was kind of like, I've made it. Is it like I achieved what I always set out to, whether I never played football again, I stepped foot on a professional football field. So that moment kind of always, because you know what it's like, you you just see yourself as Jamal and Femi from whatever area you're from. You're just like, I, I made it to be a professional footballer. Like, wow, like, that's a bit mad. So that moment for me was crazy because I remember standing on the touchline and a Delta rap was coming off. And it was against Crystal Palace away. And my, do you know when you get told off in school and your legs are shaking, but they're not shaking? You know them ones where they're moving? And I was like, oh my God. And Warnock was like, get on there, get the ball and just run. So like, I literally did that. When I got the ball, it was almost like Forrest Gump moment where I just had my head down and I was just running. Um, that moment. <laughs> and, so then, cool. and then the other moment was going to Red Star. Definitely going to Red Star because of the magnitude of the club. I didn't really understand it at the time. But... Um, Everyone else around me was saying how big it was. So that was kind of like a, a crazy moment for me. So tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, Slovenia, Red Star, Belgrade. Yeah. Club yeah. that we've all heard about, Champions League. Yeah. What was that like? like how, the, how did you end up there? Because there's some people that don't even like leaving London or leaving their hometown to oh. go down the motorway, the M25. So how did you manage that and how did you feel about it? Was there any homesickness? How did you... What was it like? You, you say this, and I suffered from that. So when I left QPR, obviously QPR from where I live 
isn't too far it's 20 minutes like around the corner so I'm, I'm a homebody anyway I love being at home with my family then when I left QPR I went to Oldham and I had homesickness because I kind of gone from being able to go home every day to now being sat in Oldham which isn't the best of places even though it's close to Manchester and my routine was train go and sit indoors and watch tv all day make myself some food go sleep like it was literally on repeat because I had no one there but then when I left there I said to my agent and my my son had just been born I think yeah um no tell a lie I came to Dagenham, came to Dagenham. on loan I came to Dagenham on loan because my my missus was pregnant at the time and I wanted to be close to home because she was about to drop so when I left there um I injured my foot. I was out of football for six months. I uh, didn't have a club. You know, the usual cycle that most of us have been through. Um, and then when it came to, like, coming back into football, I had a brief spell at Oxford for three months. I signed a three-month contract. And then I said to my agent, I need to get away from all the distractions. Like, you know what it's like when you first come through at football, no one really knows about football. They probably think that you earn 10 grand, I earn 50 grand, Femi earns 35 grand. They don't realise the that what goes on behind closed doors or how it really is. So I said, I need to re remove myself from the stigma that I've got tons of money, I should pay for everything. Oh, let's go to a nightclub, let's get a fancy car that I probably can't afford, all the things that we all fall into, all the traps, girls, all this, all these things. So I was like, I need to get away from it. He's like, What do you mean? And I was like, I think I want to go abroad. And he was like, yeah, Really? And I was like, Yeah. So he's like, Where do you want to go? I was like, I don't care. So then he mentioned Slovenia. And when when you say that word, it sounds cold. I don't know why. Slovenia sounds cold. Hey, you really didn't care. You really didn't. <laughs> didn't. So then he was like, the contract's on the table, but you can go and train for a week and see if you like it. And obviously, if you don't like it, we won't sign the contract. And da -da. Went there. This place was like 35 degrees. They have a winter break. Um, it's about two hours from Italy, um, close to Germany, Austria. And I was like, yeah. So then signed there. My partner at the time came out with me. Um, and it was amazing. Like, the, the country is beautiful. And I don't know if you know um, Rolando Errands. Yeah. He's just gone to Slovenia, literally. Signed yeah. two weeks ago. Um, amazing country. Standard of football is exceptional. Very technical, like Italy. So it kind of started to change me as a player as well. Um, I was used to, you know, it's like when you play in England, get it, get down the line, put a cross in. That, that used to be the way. When I got there, they're like, no, 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 get in, get in the pocket, come in here, do this, do that. And they started to coach me, which I think in football doesn't happen enough nowadays. Not enough coaches coach. It's very team-based. They're not going, right, Femi, um, you've still got more to give us. You need to get in this position and I think you, you could be good in here and your strength is this. Like, no one coaches anymore. So when I went there, it kind of started to mould me as a man. Um, so I was there for 18 months, did really well. Um, and I had loads of options. But during that 18 month spell, me and my partner at the time broke up. So my son and my missus have moved back to the UK. Um, so that kind of threw another span in the works where I'm on my own again, now not around my child. Then I'm having to go to court for my child. All these things that a lot of professional footballers go through. Um, and it's always good to touch on them because everyone goes through it. Um, and then uh, six months after she left, I got to move to Red Star. So Red Star probably wasn't my actual uh, first choice because obviously finances are everything. I could have gone to Sturm Graz. I could have gone to a team in China. China was the first option. Um, and like I said, I always keep it very honest and authentic. I remember getting pulled up into the office by the sport director and I thought I was in trouble because we always used to argue. And there was some Chinese guy sat there and he was like, we came and watched your game last week. Um, their owner wants you to go and sign at their team and the first thing I said was but my son like I'm going through like a court thing with my son and I, I want him to be able to come out and they were like yeah we'll put in free uh first class tickets for your part your ex-partner and your son to come out every month um and anything additional to that you can pay for so in my head I'm like mad excited I'm thinking I've made it so then they offered me a crazy amount of money this before the whole China thing happened um, uh, so then I walked out of the office, messaged my agent and I was like, yes, like finally I've like got what I feel like I deserve. Message my ex-partner. She goes, no full stop. <laughs> Just no full stop. That was it. There's no further discussions. I tried to message her parents to say like, 
I can change, uh, uh, like change our life and my son's life. It was just, there was just no more discussion around it. Um, so then Red Star was the next option in terms of, I everyone wanted me to go to Red Star, but I didn't know the magnitude of it until I spoke to my grandfather. Cause obviously they were big in the nineties when I was a baby, like winning Champions League and stuff like that. So then my agent was like, no, you don't understand. This club is huge. And the window that it presents to you is crazy. So then it was only an hour and 15 minutes flight from London, which is super quicker than going to Manchester. Um, so I ended up meet it, going for a meeting, flying to Belgrade, meeting a director, signing there. Um, but I remember when I came out the airport or when I was on a plane, my agent was like, right, when you be, when you come here, no more arguing, no more being confrontational. Da, 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 da. Um, but when you get here, you're going to be like, almost like a Ronaldo at United. And I was like, you're actually chatting with fish. Like, do you hear what you're saying? He's like, no, the way people love football in this country is like a religion. They love it more than their children. So I'm not obviously deep in it. So I remember getting off the plane and remember three months prior, um, no, three months prior to going to Slovenia, I'd left Oxford and they said, you're a really good player, but we want a more experienced squad next year. Then I obviously moved myself abroad. Now I'm coming to Serbia. I remember getting off the plane, walking out of the exit in the in the arrivals and there being like 60 cameras just flashing off like paparazzi, everything, people coming up to me, Parker, Parker, with my name already on shirts and stuff like that, getting into a limousine. Like it was crazy. And I got in and my agent went, I told you so. And then we were just laughing, just laughing in the car. I was like, this is too crazy. Go and do the proper press, like where you're sat obviously on the big desk and holding up your shirt with the... And it was just a lot. It was really overwhelming. But then it kind of sunk in that this is serious now. This is like massive. Then you have your first home game and you see 60, 70,000 people every week. And yeah, it was just mad. That that period for me was just like, oh, this is a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy for you because um, I'm happy <laughs> for that story. That story put a smile on my face because you really felt what it's like to be like the top end. Yeah, bro, like, bro, real life. It, was exceptional and the one thing I have to take accountability but I'm not mad at it throughout my career is I've had so many clubs because I will never I will always stand on what I believe in and I will never um, sacrifice that or sacrifice a part of myself uh, to get somewhere so a lot of times most of the clubs I've left is because of arguments because I'm either defending someone else or the manager's done something wrong to someone or said something wrong to someone. I'm like, that's not right. Don't do that. And then we have arguments. I leave. It literally, you can go through every club and I could tell you a crazy story and I'd always be 100% honest about them. And it was no different at Red Star, um, probably Red Star and Q, uh, not Red Star, uh, Slovenia and QPR, but maybe the two clubs where I haven't left because of uh, a fallout. No, you're right. You're right. I've definitely, I've definitely heard a couple. There's quite a bit to unpack here, Josh, because you've said a lot of things. And one thing I do like about it is um, your transparency. I feel like you're very transparent. Um, you spoke about the lows, but you also spoke about the highs in the same, in the same sense. Yeah, but like, the same. Bro, like, I don't mean it arrogantly, but I've probably been through more in football than anyone I know. Well, I know I've been based on, if you think about the top people, they obviously go through financial issues. But I'm talking about the magnitude of stuff like I've had, when I had to fall out with Red Star and they stopped paying me and all of these things, which we can get into. Um, I'd gone from playing Champions League qualifiers to six months later working in a coffee shop because they've got my transfer papers and I can't earn an income. But then they're trying to sue me for two and a half million pounds because that was my buyout clause. Like, But then I'm working in my godfather's coffee shop, never drank coffee in my life, don't know how to serve coffee, taught me overnight before he opened the shop because he was still being a teacher at school but had this idea of opening a hip-hop coffee shop so I've gone from playing in the last round of Champions League qualifiers to six months later serving Janice at the coffee shop like, like I've been through a lot and uh and it's a lot of stuff that people can relate to because even at my time at Red Star go like playing um didn't score in the first two games and I I knew it was a big club like a massive club but then Major was like there's pressure here like, I'm, he said, I'm talking like Real Madrid pressure. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense because the club's not Real Madrid. He was like, no, but to the fans it is. After two games, I didn't score my first two games. They were both away. Um, 
getting messages on Facebook. I'm talking like 500. You best score the next game. This is Red Star. Do you know how big the club is? Da -da 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 -da. Monkey emojis. No, 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 no. Like mad stuff. Like I'm like, oh lord. Then the first home game it was like some anniversary, and I scored two. Um, and then I remember going on a night out after that game with my agent because he was in Serbia with me, and I remember being in a club, just us two, literally just having drinks, and a fan came up to me. He was like, oh god, like put his arm around me. He's like, if anyone troubles you tonight, let me know. I'll kill them. And he was so serious. And my agent was like, yeah, it's good, mate. He was like, no, seriously, if anyone troubles you, you let me know, they will be dead. I'm like, this is a next level. Like, this is like mafia, like real stuff. But like I said, I've been through so much in football. Um, and even at those high highs, and this is what I've realized in life, life isn't always up. It's con if someone asked me how life is, I would probably say, and I don't want to swear, terribly um amazingly crap because this for me is amazing this conversation with you two but then i might go downstairs and my daughter's been, been sick on the carpet it's it's that constant yin and yang like it is always that so when i'm at red star i'm going for a court battle to be a father to my son and spending thousands on that so it's amazing and terrible at the same time because when i'm on the pitch i forget about it but then when i come off the pitch i've got to realize that i've got to be a dad i can forget my son and not be a dad but that's not the person i am so it's it's constantly like that i feel you properly you know i feel you properly you know and, and everyone goes through those phases as well and it's like the, the older you get the more it becomes that you know one moment you're you're happy or whatever and then literally the next moment something crazy just happened you know yeah, I mean? like that, that whole red star thing like it's weird now i look back on it i don't see it as a negative because i played with some unbelievable players and players that have gone on to amazing things like there's Marco Grujic who's at Porto who went to Liverpool obviously up front it was me and Luka Jovic who's obviously after that went Benfica Madrid now he's at Milan like, and I still speak to those guys like a lot of the guys went on to do amazing things and I always think that could have been me going on to X Y and Z or, or on to bigger and better things but like I said my morals and stuff like that wouldn't let me get there and I'm not mad at myself for it because the reason I fell out with the people at Red Star was because my nan passed away. I wanted to come home for the funeral and they said no. Wow. You wouldn't be human if you said, okay, no problem. I'll just carry on playing. Literally, I remember the conversation. I was on my way to training in a taxi. My mum calls me. She's crying. I was like, what's going on? She's like, oh, your nan's passed away. Like someone went into the house and found her. Boom. I'm like, cool. So it hasn't really processed. I'm like, I've got training. So I'm training. Then it hits me. So now I kind of have a little breakdown and all the boys are asking what's going on. I tell them speak to the manager he's like i don't pay you your uh, i don't pay your wages but i'm happy for you to go home but you have to speak to the director so as i'm walking out the pictures at red star the training pictures are sunken so you walk down to them like it's really like cool so then as i'm walking up into the car park um the director's like oh i heard there's a problem i was like yeah my nan's passed away um i was wondering if i could fly home just for two days just to be with my mum and obviously the few like plan the funeral i don't think that we're gonna allow that what do you mean and he was like, well, your nan was old. She was going to die. That was his words. I was like, oh, my God. I said, I'm going to walk away before I say, say or do something I regret. And he was like, do you think if his words were, do you think if Frank Lampard's parents passed away or nan passed away, he'd want to go home? And I was like, yeah. And no one would tell him nothing. That's why you're not going to tell me nothing. So we had a whole massive fallout. We're having an argument in front of everyone. So then I played every game up until that point. Then it came to the Saturday and they dropped me and didn't bring me on for a minute. So then me being a person of like morals, I was like, you could have let me go home because if you knew you was going to drop me and not play me, I could have been gone. So then what happened was they booked me a flight for the Sunday after the game and said, you can come back on Wednesday. I get a message from Luca, your bitch on the Monday saying, where are you bro? And I was like, oh, I'm at home, like obviously to do with my nan. And they sent me a newspaper article in them countries, they run the papers. That's how they sell a lot of players, by hyping them up in the papers and say, and linking them with clubs. So then clubs come and look. So I'll go, so-and-so is linked with Liverpool. And then Liverpool will be like, are we? Let's go and have a look then. Um, and I was like, huh? And it's like, uh, Parker's nowhere to be seen. That was the title. And I was like, so I messaged one of the people at the club, the, like the director's secretary. And I was like, 
are you lot not going to come out and say anything? Because obviously this is in the paper, but that's not true. And I was getting messages from fans again, like now thousands of messages saying, how dare you do this to our club, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, no, don't worry, it'll blow over. I'm like, okay, something's going on here. Something's going on here. So now I go back. Then from then, cold shoulder, cold shoulder. You're not training with a team. Da, 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 da. That's when I went on loan to Aberdeen, funny enough. Yeah. Mm. Clubs, I'm going clubs. over it quickly, but yeah. Yeah, a lot of clubs do that. A lot of clubs, um, when they're unhappy with a player, they find a, they find a way. Um, yeah. But Fem, what was you gonna, what was you gonna touch on there? Yeah, I was saying obviously, like, um, it seems like you've you've mentioned it already, like regarding your morals and that, and um, obviously that translating into football um, is probably like you said the reason why you've left so many different clubs. There was um, a particular story, um, and I hope you don't mind going into it. I know. Okay. I heard about uh, Gillingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I knew this. But before I touch on that story, yeah, and this is why I've probably gone down, uh, you probably see it like the spiritual route or like whether you want to call it religion or whatever, because when I look back on my career, because I've always been true to myself, it's always worked in my favour and I'll go over that. It's a little bit like coincidental but um the Gillingham thing was I remember it was a Tuesday night Swansea at home uh FA Cup and I was flying at Gillingham like the manager kind of gave me the reins to do whatever I want he literally would say to me do whatever you want so I was scoring I was assisting I was like flying um because you know it's like when a manager installs that confidence in you to like trust you and say you've got you've got my back and I've got yours um and I remember he walked in and there was a young boy um who usually had plaits and he had his hair out because he couldn't get it done in time and the manager walked in and he stopped and he went what the fuck are you doing and he was like what do you mean and the boy was only 18 I was like what do you mean he was like what is that on your head and he was like it's my hair and he was like, "What? Why is it like that?" And he was like, "Oh, well, I did. I had an appointment, but the girl dropped out, and I couldn't get my hair done." And he was like, "Is this place a fucking joke to you? Um, are you a clown?" And I'm looking around, and in my head, it's funny because I went, "It's going to be me again." And then he went, um, "Is this a joke?" And he was like, "No, like I just couldn't get my hair done." I could see the uncomfortableness in his face. So then. As you know, in Gillingham, the changing room's there and then the showers are almost joined to it. So he goes in there to write the team. And I look around and I go, is no one going to say nothing? And the captain at the time was from uh, Congo as well. Like, and they're boys. Like, even though he's a kid, they travel in together and also they have that cultural connection. I was like, is no one going to say nothing? Because what he just said is nuts. And then he came out and he went, what did you say you see you next Tuesday? And I was like, Firstly, don't speak to me like that, because if he wasn't in a change room, you wasn't the manager, you wouldn't speak to me like that. I was like, secondly, the only reason you've come out is because I've said something and you know what you said is wrong. And he was like, oh, yeah, make it about you. Um, it was a joke. And I was like, the look on his face, don't say it was a joke. And I said, plus your top scorer over there has got long hair almost down to his bum and you've never said anything about his hair. And he was like, um, oh, F off, da 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 and he was like, get your stuff and get out of the change room. Obviously, I was the kind of main player there at the time. And I was like, I'm not moving. I was like, I'll sit here until I'm ready to get out. So I sit there and I said to them, look, like he kind of stormed off and carried on doing the team. And then I was like, you lot are actually pussies. The fact that none of you want to say nothing, like I've got no respect for you. And then I picked up my stuff, walked out. And then he put the young boy in the squad, like in uh, on the bench. I think he might have even come on that night. Um, the young boy came in and basically said uh, thank you for doing that obviously I wouldn't say anything because you've got your career I haven't got mine and it can be taken from me at any moment in time um, and he was like I appreciate that I was like that's no, cool and that was the last day of the transfer window so I had like well it was the day before the last day of the transfer window so obviously I called my agent and he's like I explained he's like again he's like why do you always have to say something I was like what do you what expect me to do stand there and say nothing like that's not right so then he called the Gillingham director and basically said, you ain't giving me time to find him a club. It's now January. 
um, pay him up X amount and that will see him through to the end of the season. Then we can kind of go back there. What the next day while they're paying me up, I'm on my way to Charlton and sign there and get promoted. Yep, I remember that. I remember that. Which was, which worked out in your favour, isn't it? I'm saying, but when you, when you go through my whole career, yeah, it's going to sound mad freaky, yeah? Everywhere I've been where a manager's been good to me or, like, I've wanted to go, they've always done well. Whether I play a part in it in terms of how many games I play is a different thing. But it's almost too freaky to be coincidental. So QPR, when I was there, Warnock gave me my debut. They'd been in the champ for years and years, like 20 years. The debut, the season I kind of make my debut, they get promoted. Um, then obviously I go to Slovenia. That team was struggling. They end up finished second in the league. I moved to Serbia. Uh, Red Star had been in debt for years and been struggling. I think they went on to beat um, Arsenal's unbeaten record. I think they did something like 50 certain games and started qualifying for the Champions League again, even though they hadn't qualified for like four years. Then uh, when I go to Gillingham on my debut, I score on my debut and it's the goal that ended up keeping them up because it was us and Port Vale. And then obviously leave Gillingham, go to Charlton. Charlton had been in League One for ages. Go there. They were... I think they were like six at the time or something, but went on like a 14 unbeaten like run, end up getting promoted, leave there, go to Wickham. Wickham have never been promoted, get promoted back to back. But obviously, on one hand, you've got Charlton, uh, biggest playoff crowd in history. Next season, get promoted with Wickham, empty stadium, COVID. Uh, leave Wickham and ask to go to Burton, had better options, but I wanted to work under Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. They were rock bottom of of the league 10 points adrift I said to my agent if I go there because all this weird stuff's happened in the past they won't get relegated end up winning bear games and staying up uh, leave Burton mash up my foot go to Oxford I even posted it after we won the thingy I messaged the, the manager um, when he said he wanted me to sign I said if you sign me you'll get promoted and that was in September they were 8th uh, and we got promoted I did see that how many, so how many promotions have you actually got in your career Josh? Four. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So here's my question. Would you would you change any part of your career? You know, there's there's things that sometimes you look back and think, mm, that part of my career could have gone better. Or do you think, okay, that part I really enjoyed. Is there anything you'd actually change? You won because I wouldn't change it because of where I'm at now in terms of things off of the pitch and where I'm at in terms of my happiness within football. Like it's the most I've enjoyed football right now. Maybe because there's not as much pressure because I've had my career. But then obviously there's always things that I think, oh, what if? Like when I was at QPR, they offered me a three-year deal and I turned it down. Oh yeah, you got to sign the three year. You got to sign that. You got to sign that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's childish. I know, I know. Um, I know. <laughs> yeah, that. And then, but there's always external factors and I put it down to, like, if you're if you're moving with ill intentions or doing bad stuff, whether it's on the pitch or off the pitch, bad stuff's going to come and good stuff will come if you're doing good. So that's why it's almost been like a, almost like an oxymoron in terms of actions where my football has gone good because my intentions in football have always been good. But then I was doing silly stuff off of the pitch and being childish off of the pitch. And that kind of hampered my football, if that makes sense. Of course. So things like um, if I was if I broke up on better terms with my ex-partner, maybe the China thing would have happened. Da, da, da. Like, do you know all these little things that made me realise, like, it, it's more than just football or, like, just being, like, you have to be a good person and move with the right intentions, if you get what I mean, no matter what you do. Because the karma thing for me seems to be real. Like, no, when I, I look at my career. I've got, I got something for you, Josh, yeah? So... Obviously, look, you've had a lot of bus stops, had a lot of arguments. Looking back at it, would you deal with, um, let's talk about that Gillian and one in particular, would you have dealt with it differently now you're a 30, 33 year old man? You know what I mean? Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. I said you, no, like, because, and this is what I say, because if I dealt with it different, I don't go to Charlton and I don't get promoted. If I don't go to Charlton, I don't go to Wickham. And I don't, do you get what I mean? So everything's always worked in my favour to some degree. Maybe it could have gone better. Maybe I could have gone to China and took that three-year deal and done X, Y, and Z. Maybe I could have not had the argument about my nan's funeral and not been so hard-headed 
um, and uh, gone to X, Y, and Z. Like, but I'm not displeased, and no one can ever say um, Josh doesn't have my back or Josh uh, is is fake. Like, if anything, I'm almost too real that I hamper myself in order to make people realize that you don't have to accept that. You know, there is there is a um, there is a mask sometimes you have to put on in this in most industries. To be fair, I don't so, think you can be always authentically yourself in every single job. Um, but in football, sometimes there are times when you have to maybe conform a little bit. But listen, your morals and the, and the ones you stand by as a man, that's that's up to you, you know. I, I've, I've been in a similar situation to you where something was said in the change room that I definitely didn't like, but I took a different approach. I went and spoke to him one-on-one -on -one and explained to him that that probably isn't the way mm. you should talk to players or um, a team or address a group. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, that, as Femi said, there's different ways of dealing with things. But Femi, I want to throw that question to you. Is there any part of your journey, Femi, that you'd change? Ah, you know, similar to similar to Josh, other than the career Josh has had, but similar to him, there's like moments where it's like, oh, maybe I should have taken that deal. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should have taken um, this deal. Uh, Luton offered me a deal. Luton in the Premier League, you know. Um, yeah. So there's moments like that, but like I said, the man I am today. I, what's in front of me and everything I can achieve. I think I think I think I've done all right to be in this position that I'm in today. You know, you know? Yeah. And that's the reason why. Who knows, it could be better. I'm not in the best position, do you know what I mean? It could but like it's like, yeah, I've got everything from the take back. I can have everything's in my reach, isn't it? You know, but it's, but it's what I'm saying, like it's when you at like, the deepest thing, um it all comes down to intention. So we might have all had the opportunity to earn a lot more money and move here, do this, do that. But yeah, this, and this probably would have been my, like you said, you asked for a bit of advice for a young, young player at the end, but this would be my advice. Like you as a person before you was a footballer, a lot of people think football makes them the person they are. So I always have this saying that if you're yourself long enough, people will pay you to be that. So right now you two are leaders. Uh, amazing at talking um, amazing at spreading knowledge and awareness and your intentions are there so eventually someone's going to pay you enough money to be these people that you are because it's the intention is pure you're not doing this because you think there's a billionaire pound at the end of it you would like it to make you money but you do it because the intention's there and the the caring's there sure for sure I like you, you know, it's okay. so this is what I talk about all the time yeah, this is this is the and this is why we had to get Josh on. It was Femi's idea, and I can see why he wanted you on, Josh, man. Um, nice, it's been an amazing combo so far. And we're definitely gonna carry it on. We're definitely gonna carry it on. But let's just get into the games quickly. This is like the byproduct of it, because this conversation is a bit crazy. Um, but yeah, another crazy fixture um list yesterday. Um, the ups and downs of the National League strike again, and AFC filed right at home to Bromley. AFC fouled, 22nd place, Bromley in second place. We all know what we expected there. But Femi, Danny Omarod popped up with the winner. Um, and that's now three wins in the last four for AFC fouled. How have you seen their progress in the last few games, Femi? Yeah, they're, they're picking it up. Um, Lee's getting interesting, ain't it? It's really <laughs> getting interesting. Um, I went to the third quarter of the season. Teams are teams are really starting to put results together. And AFC Fouled, AFC Fouled is one of them, you know. Um, they managed to take down Bromley. Um, Bromley had an 11 game unbeaten run. And, and obviously, AFC Fouled took them down in it. So it's a massive, massive result, massive result for them. And that's, that's definitely took them a couple of places up in the table. It's still in the relegation zone, but definitely they can see some, um, some light at the end of the tunnel now. You know, so yeah, hope God willing they continue their run and we'll see how it goes in the season. They definitely stay. They ended one run and started their own. So obviously they drew the other four, um, game. So props to them. Um, one of your old teams, Josh, Wildstone. Mm -hmm. 13th place taking on Halifax. Um, and they won 2-0. That's 10 unbeaten at home for them now as well. Um, Aaron Henry and Tavon Campbell popping up with the goals in that game. Um, obviously they've lost their manager. 
So how did you see that result? And explain a little bit about what you know about Wollstone. So before you go, Dave, um, they just appointed um, David Noble from St. Albans. Yeah, I, I see that. I see that the other day because obviously we played St. Albans in the final last year. Um, he seems to be like a good manager. Go like, go ahead, St. Albans. Let's get it right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he seems to be a good manager. Obviously, he had a good career anyway. Um, but I think he'll, I think he'll do well there because they were already a, a nice foot. Like they had a style that they were trying to play. Um, I remember playing them earlier on in the season. Um, yeah, I think he'll do really well there. And uh, it's 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 an interesting club because it is a good club, but they're kind of in a bit of limbo. They're neither up there nor down there at the minute. If you, I mean, in terms of in general. Um, so yeah, I think he'll go there and do well. I think they need to give him kind of the freedom to or the time, which we know is a dying thing in football, to kind of express himself or stamp himself on that team um, because he's going to have changes here and there. Obviously, uh, um, St. Albans, they played a very similar formation to what we do. They played a back three, with the, sometimes with the box, sometimes not with a box in midfield. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it's a good appointment for them. I do think it's a good appointment. No, for sure. I, th I think St. Albans have always done well. They've had good FA Cup runs. Um, they're always up there within the league. And their style of play is something that attracts a lot of people. So it's no surprise that you see a lot of managers with a certain style of play getting the, the moves. You know, you see Stuart Maynard, the people are looking at that. Yeah, but he's at Wilson, they're 30th, yes, but his style of play really suited the team he's going to. So that's probably the reason why. Um, but looking at another team that's been flying recently, Aldershot, they played Rochdale, a game that you probably wouldn't maybe think it would be a tough game to, to call. Um, but I was played out in front of 3,000 fans at Aldershot. And Aldershot won that game 3 1. Laurent Tollard scoring his 12th goal of the season. Kan Harris and Jack Barnum scoring as well. That old that old guard, that old man, Ian Henson, still plucking up, popping up with the goals as well. He scored his 11th of the season. Um, so, Fem, talk to me. We had uh, Ty Sinclair on the show last week, and he spoke glowingly of what Jim McNulty's doing at Rochdale. But what did you see from that game, Femi? Yeah, all well, the shot they've had, they've had a great season so far. And, and what's interesting is that 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 result knocked Rochdale out of the playoffs and they put all the shot into the playoffs. So it just goes to show how how tight the league is and how competitive the league is. Um, obviously they lost Josh Stokes in the week uh, to Bristol to Bristol City. Uh, obviously he's come back on loan as well, which is good, you know. So that's a that's a bonus for him. But him and Talaj, they've been pulling up trees this season. They've actually been pulling up trees. And it, at the beginning of the year, when you talk about players to watch and whatnot, it's like, I'll be honest with you, their name wasn't really at the forefront, you know? And they might have took that, they might have taken that personal. They might have taken that personal. And and this is the reason why they're performing and putting in performances and scoring the goals and getting the results uh, that they're doing, you know, everyone has a different sort of motivation, but those two are definitely doing well and really uh, getting results for all the shit right now. So, yeah. For sure. And another player that's gone, um, got a move, is Krahaus from Bromley. So the, the National League is where it's at. A lot of gems are being plucked left, right and centre. And it's just, it just goes to show how well the National League's doing, man. Um, but one of the bigger games, Oldham versus Eastleigh. Oldham currently flying in fourth place. And we played Eastleigh in the week, a crazy 4-4 draw. But they can see the number four Eastleigh. Um, Lewis Banks, Regan Linney, Alex Newby, and that man, Chris Cronclark, their talisman, their number 10, popping up with his 15th goal this season. It's funny, I've been watching Captains on Netflix, Captains of the World, and... They were talking about the the um, the allure of the number ten shirt, and Chris, I feel like Chris Conn Clark really epitomizes that. He really puts his team on his back, and also a team that I don't think anyone wants to play in. I think I know their manager was highly touted to be the one that got the notch job as well, and I wouldn't be surprised if they called his phone, but Altrincham declined all calls because he, he's really putting his team together and they're really playing a style of football that's really impressive. I've been really impressed with what they've got going on down there. And obviously, Justin Alunzo 
doing great things as well. Um, but we're going on to our game as well. And it's getting a bit... It's tough for me coming on after another loss. Um, obviously, Ty got sent off yesterday against Dorkin. And they beat us 3-0. Jason Pryor, Alfred Rutherford and Charlie Carter popping up with the goals. It's, it's, it's really... Um, when you're down at the wrong side of the table and you're kind of looking over your shoulder, it's, it's tough to, to put into words, really, especially when we're so used to being successful, being at the right end of the table. Um, but yes, it's one of those... It's hard to explain. It's hard to put your finger on it. I was talking to someone on the, from Dorkin and he was asking me questions about what it's like here and what's, what's been the change. And it's, it's kind of hard to put my finger on. And if I had the answers, probably wouldn't be here. So... Them, obviously, you played in it. Um, still a raw emotion on that one. Um, but sum up your thoughts on it quickly for me. Everything was everything was everything was was, was bad, bro. And um we came out of the block slow. Came out of the block slow. We didn't start great. Set piece can see from another set piece. Um, mistakes, you know, it's it's we just we're just not helping ourselves at the moment. We're just not helping ourselves, you know. And when it's no, it's not even coming from that like one particular place. Like the whole team, even including myself, you know. Like, it's, it's 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 hard to stop. It's hard to stop, and I don't even call it. Uh, you can call it unlucky, but I don't even think it's unlucky. I just think we just need to be better. Simple as it. We need to be better. We need to go in it. Go into games different mindset. Go into games full of confidence. Go into games knowing that we've done our bits during the week. You know, because. We can't, we can't afford to be leaving this thing to chance, you know, um, putting up on a Saturday and hoping it goes well. Mm. Yeah. Can't afford to be doing that, especially this end of the season as well. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. And the thing about, I suppose the, the, there's always positives and there's always another game. Um, we've got most of the gaff coming back from international duty as well um so that's 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 going to be a, a big push for us um, but one of your old teams another one who's having a bit of a roller coaster season josh oldham um they played wokener in 20th place and they probably expected to win that game after so many good results from mickey mellon since he came in Six thousand fans watched that game but they lost to woken um one nil jermaine anderson popped up with the goal in that game first win for michael doyle and we had our ex-guest, Alexis Andre, um, sent me a message saying that Norwood didn't succeed this week in scoring against him, Josh. So talk to me about Oldham and what you've seen from them this season. Um, I remember playing them and that was the one, I think it's the first, the one game that I haven't started all season because I just come back from international. And they beat us 4-0. But it wasn't a 4-0. It was so strange. Like It's been like a lot of our games where experience obviously plays a massive factor because they've got a lot of experience. They're like a really well-oiled machine. But there's nothing exceptional about them. That's what I would say. Like, there's nothing exceptional about them. There's a few teams that are like, they have things that they're very good at. I don't think they're very good at anything. I think they're just very consistent. And also, uh, I think a lot of teams get intimidated by them. Boy. When you think of a Norwood or whether... Um, it's a Chesterfield and it's a Brig. Like a lot of people are already defeated mentally, um. So that plays a big factor. Obviously, their fan base is amazing. Um, when they're playing at home, but I don't think it should be too much of a surprise because because player for player, uh, Woken have got a very good squad, and they've got a big budget. They've got a lot of players that are experienced in this league and leagues above. So I don't think that's that's not too much of a shock to me. Woken are going through a similar season to us, to be fair. They did really well last year to get into the playoffs. Um, but this season, for some reason, it just hasn't clicked. And Oldham adding fuel to the fire by bringing in Andrew Dallas as well. 
another striker who scored 20 goals last year before he gets his move to Barnsley. So he'll probably be looking to hit the ground running. Um, but Femi, your role team, Dagenham and Redbridge, got taken down by Kidderminster at home. Um, Kidderminster, unbelievable run since Phil Brown came in. Um, probably looking like the right decision to change manager. Caleb Richards scored the goal in that game, Femi. So, and obviously, Josh, I want to get your perspective because it's another one of your old teams as well. But Fem, talk to me about that game and what you saw from it. Yeah, Kid Minister finally off the foot of the table. Um, listen, it was tough. It was tough seeing Russell Penn go. It was tough. Uh, but this is why chairmen, owners of football clubs are owners. <laughs> as hard as it is to see a man that's Bought a club so much success, leave. Sometimes change is needed. And that's why the managerial career is a cruel, cruel game, you know, because change is needed. And Phil Brown's coming in and he won three games in a row. And that is not easy, you know. There's one forgotten, man. That, that's the honest truth, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, three, three wins, as we know, that's not easy on the bounce. It's, it's not easy. So it looks like, it, like the owners is owners are there looking. Look, yeah, I've made the right decision. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's the same squad, fam. It's the same. Okay, no, it's not. They brought in um, a defender. They brought in one or two, but generally it's the same squad. It's the same pool he's going to. It's the same well he's going to get water from. Yeah, he's getting different ethos though. Getting different. Ethos. That that might be the same as why. Um, your yourselves and your Wokins are having like kind of like an off season, if you want to call it that, because sometimes a manager's ethos changes or just evolves what was already there. So they can see this wasn't working. Maybe I can build upon it. So it might come. To are you not looking at the players like you couldn't string two pass together a minute ago? Now you're bopping me, bopping the team to life. Like how does. No, because, because the manager might come in and coach. He's he's coached at the, managed at the top level, so maybe he's telling you things that the other coach wasn't. Oh, why are you going out there? Stay at home. I remember when I was at QPR, um, the first thing Warnock said in the first meeting he had was, "We all want more money and more time." So I'm up in your win bonus every game, you, and every game you win, you're off on a Monday. And um, if the ball went over a defender's head, they were under strict uh, instructions that the ball goes into row Z. Everyone gets behind the ball. And similar to yourselves last season, I think in that championship season, they conceded 19 goals. I think you lot conceded maybe even less. So it was very, very, um, here's what we do. You don't go outside of that. You never pass back to the goalkeeper because it puts him under pressure. You put it into row Z, you get in your position and everyone gets behind the ball. And then we'll focus on set plays. And when we're in the final third, do whatever you want. Do you know, what that, you know, what, that, you know what that sounds like to me though? That's just back to basics. That's just there you go. That's just, when you're when you're when you're under it, you don't do anything silly. You know, there's no need to try and do anything fancy. Just get back to basics. It, it take me back to um, the Man City documentary where Fabian Delph was just going in on his team, talking about we're forgetting the basics of football. I think when your back's against the wall, you just got to get to the, back to the basics: run, tackle, press. Is <laughs> yeah. that and maybe that's what Phil Brown's brought back into. Kid Minster, you know, but he's definitely doing something. Yes, he also, he's also a big manager as well. So there's there's a level of respect that the players are going to have from him the moment he walks into a building, into the building. You know, so but he's doing well. He's doing really well. He really is. And there was a game that I called the Battle of the Strikers. Um, and Josh, it's good that you're here because you can we can get your perspective. Um, Hartlepool versus York, two big big clubs in the north of England. 5,000 fans watched that game. Hartlepool ran out 2-1 winners in Kevin Phillips' first game in charge. Um, Manny Desiriri has been out for six games, but he popped out of a brace, taking his tally to 15. And Dippo Akinyemi took his tally to 11 with a late, late consolation penalty. How do you see those two strikers? Do you look at strikers and what they're doing? Obviously, McCallum didn't score this week, but he's already on, I think, 26. He's near enough 30 for the season in total. Three new goals. Yeah, so tell me tell me what you see from that from those strikers in that game, Josh. Um, 
I think there's a, there are a lot of good strikers in this league. Like I do think there there are. Um, I think every team has like at least one or two that like could get you 15, 20 goals a season. Um, obviously, McCullum was like numbers are crazy. And I think a big part of that, based on obviously playing against them, and you'll probably say the same, is the team plays to his strengths. Yeah. Plays to his strengths. Long throws, not shy to cross the ball. And this is what I'm saying. When you, I, I, saw that, I saw them crossing. They were crossing the ball from midway between their box. Yes. They, yes. They, they really, 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 really played to his strengths. Yeah, yeah, really played to his strengths. And even like um, free kicks. The free kicks in their half and they're loading it. I'm like, oh my. It might be a Wickham with Akin Fenwa. And I'm like, okay, but hats off. It gets results. It gets him goals. And that's that. Like, he might not. He might be the best striker in the league. He might not be. It might be Grig. It might be whoever. But if a team's playing to your strengths, you're always going to have chances. And then it's down to him to convert those chances. So it's another example of going back to basics. If you've got two six foot four strikers, what do they want? They want the ball in the air or in the box. So do that. Sure. For sure, um, we played we played against him and uh, we played against Maka for years. And we had him on the show, great guy, but he's having one of those seasons, man. It's, it's obviously Chesterfield are not missing him because they're absolutely flying. But what he's doing, it'll be so it's going to be surprising to see if he's still there by the end of this transfer window. There's definitely let's be honest, there's definitely got to be um, interest in him. But if they want to be getting to the playoffs, they're going to have to keep hold of him. Um, but Barnett. Falling away from the chasing pack. To be fair, they're chasing, but it doesn't seem like anyone's catching Chesterfield. But they played Gateshead, who have had a bit of a turnaround since um, a lot of their players left, their management staff left. But they ran out 2-1 winners. Luke Hannon scored an absolute worldie. Um, I'm not sure if you guys saw the finish. Literally, a volley from the edge of the box. Clean strike into the top corner. Nick Tabamba. Scoring again, 19 goals for him now for the season, but it wasn't enough as a Dom squad um, for Gates to take it to 2-1. Um, so, Fem, what have you seen from Barnett? Obviously, they, they've done really well this season after hitting the playoffs as well last year. Uh, um, for me, I think Barnett have, have had a great season. I think they've had a great season. Obviously, they've lost quite a few in recent times. You know, they managed to bounce back quickly. That's one thing I've noticed. So when they do the playoffs, they're, they're gonna they're gonna be in the playoffs regardless. Oh, most definitely they're gonna be in the playoffs. They're gonna be in the playoffs for sure. I'll tell you the tricky thing though. Obviously, we know Chesterfield are top, and then there's Bromley and Barnet. And I don't know why I have a feeling Oldham is gonna is going for those second and third, either second or third spot, and there's a chance they might get it. So I don't I don't know how. I don't know who's going to drop out of Bromley and Barnet. And personally, I want both of them to finish. You know, I like my Southern clubs. Yeah. I, like, I want both of them to finish second and third. But I just get this feeling. And obviously, we know all them. It was, a, it was a loss yesterday. So that kind of hindered it. You know, um, the loss to Woking. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to see Barnet or Bromley go out like that because they've been second and third for majority of the season. So... I feel like they deserve to automatically go through to the play of semis. Yeah. Um, you know how much of a how much of an advantage that has. Yeah. But Mickey Mellon's been there before. Do you know what? It's funny you say that, Ben, because I was looking at the table yesterday and I saw some signings that Hartlepool made. And they're difference makers. So as much as you say owe them, and Hartlepool are in 12th at the moment, but I actually got a feeling that Kevin Phillips. New manager bounce, about 16, less than 20 games to go. They brought in Luke Waterfall, um, Courtney Senior, who popped up with an, a, an assist on his debut, um, and Otis Khan as well. Let's not forget, congrats to Nicky Featherstone, by the way, 400 league games for uh, Hartlepool. So those signings, coupled with that ground, Desiree will be coming back. They're going to be, they're going to be ones to watch out for, for sure. No, most definitely, most definitely. And, Look, I know the the ambition will still be look, they're sitting in 12th place, you know what I mean? Um and they're only seven points, seven points outside the playoffs with with just um shy of 20 games to go, you know. So there's no way that playoffs, even if they're not speaking it vocally, 
But it's that. Josh, have you played against have you played against Luke Waterfall before, Josh? No, I don't think so. Maybe. He's, he's a cent, he's a cent, like you might think a centre half, but he's got the experience. He's got the experience. experience of a player that's been promoted, mm. and that, what that can do for a club experience. Like when you when you're bringing in certain players of that caliber, and then it makes everyone think, oh, well, okay. Mm. Obviously, there's competition in the squad as well. Like these are the little things that make a squad that make the push at the right time. So it's going to be interesting to see and. Obviously, Kevin Phillips, we all know what he's capable of when he, when he was a player. So he'll be he'll be on the training pitch with those strikers. And Josh Amir, I know he's gonna have a he's gonna have a field day learning from him. Um but they're definitely gonna be going. They're definitely they're gonna be going, even if they're not speaking of it. Even yeah. yeah. so to make that kind of appointment means that they mean business. Yeah. And to even get someone like Kevin Phillips in the door means they're having some type of conversation. That's it. 100%, 100%. Um, i mate Toby Show Silver for me. Popped up with another goal for Maidenhead as they beat Solihull Moors, who are fifth place, 2-1. Um, Josh Kelly scores as well. He's 12th goal in the season. Solihull were another one that... Mm-hmm. It seems though Chesterfield are just the only team that are just remaining consistent. And Solihull with that great start they had, and Barnett with the great start they've had. Um, it's like who's battling for second, basically, out of those two. Um, but Sam Barra popped up with the winner in that game. Josh, what have you seen from those two teams? See, Solihull, when we played them, because we played them quite early on in the season, I'm going to say in the first, maybe seven or eight, um, all the other teams we played prior, I thought, yeah, we're going to hold our own in this league. Because a lot of teams are saying, like, these lot can play football. And when I played Solihull, it was the one team that I thought, yeah, you, you could do well in, like, I think you'll do well this season. They did well for a long spell and then they kind of just fallen off. I, like, like you said, you can't put your finger on it, but something's happened. Whether it's complacency, whether it's um, they were just overachieving, I, I don't know, but they were flying at the beginning of the season. So it's interesting to see these teams starting to fall off. Now maybe it's the the pressure of now or everything that you did before for the last 30 games is irrelevant because it can all change. You could end up getting relegated still, even if you was in for the place. Like that's Let how we know you guys this year. Solihull are currently fifth in it. Mm. Do you think Solihull will finish the season in the top seven? No. Oof. I think they will. I love their squad. I, I've got some players in there that I will fight for. So, Femi, you know, wherever we play Solihull, when we used to, Josh, we used to play Solihull, yeah, it used to be a battle. Like, mm. think like Manchester United, Arsenal, tunnel yeah. game with Roy Keane versus Vieira and uh, Gary. <laughs> Like, we'd be in the tunnel, fam. Tell me if I'm lying. We'd be in the tunnel, and it'll be, they'll be going, come on, everybody, everybody would just be screaming and shouting, and we'd be looking at them and thinking, all right, cool. That's how you feel. But most teams would do that to try and intimidate. But me and Femi looked at each other like, okay, these lot, these actually mean it. Like, this is when they had, like, Carl Storer, Callum Howe. Uh, these, were the, this, these were proper battles. Those are the games that we really look forward to. So, and they've still got that, they've, they, they've lost a lot of players, but one thing they still have is Josh Kelly and Mark Beck up front. Mm-hmm. And any team that's got two strikers that can score goals, that's always going to um, stand in a good stead. So I think they would still stay in there. I think they've got enough to get Gus Mafuta in there, Osborne pulling the strings, and they've got a Clark at the back. So they've got a good team, man. Which is them. And I can't see it. I can't see them pulling out of the playoffs. Man. What do you think? As it stands right now, if you're asking me today, yeah. I think I'm with Josh. Really, I, I, I hate to say it. I hate to say it, but I think I'm with Josh on this. All of them are on the next. You've got all the shot. You got Gates and you got Rochdale, and we've got Hartlepool that you just spoke on. You know, and they're all gunning for it. And Solio's form has been very inconsistent. Not just they've had an incredible start, and that's what's held them over. You know what I mean? This period, but. If you look at November till now, the form hasn't been crazy. And on the form guide, they, they haven't been top six, top seven in a long, very, very long time. It comes down to how you can deal with pressure. And I think that ability to handle pressure comes from experience. And they've got an experienced squad, but I just think maybe some of the other squads have got more strength in that aspect in terms of 
the experience to be like, it's just another day. Whereas I think some of their players might be like, I need to perform, I need to do this. Like, No, Josh, I don't know. I can, I can name you five of their starting 11, six maybe. And I think that's enough experience on the starting 11. And maybe, I don't know, I don't know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Know, Gus, Gus, is gonna be, Femi, Gus is not going to be happy with you when he hears this episode, you know. I know, I know he's going to be upset, but I've got to do my job, in it? <laughs> but he's going to, because Gus is actually my brother. Do you know what I mean? That's nothing. Yeah. That I love, I want them to do it because of Gus, like, you know. But uh, I've just got to be, I've got to do my job. I'll tell you who I think is going to make it, who I think will end up there. I think Ultron will stay in there. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think. That's not, it's not for sure, because some people might not think. Oh, I mean, I don't think there's a person alive that I don't think Ultra is going to make it. Like, <laughs> Unless they lose Con Clark over the next couple of days. That's the only thing. If they lose that boy... Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so don't forget, they were part-time up until um, quite recently, you know. So yeah. transition for them has been amazing. Yeah. Um, but Southend, another team in transition. Obviously, transfer embargo lifted, change of ownership over now. 10 point deduction, they've eradicated that. But they went to that fortress. If I mean, what do you call the stadium again? SMH, shake my head. They went to the <laughs> SMH stadium. Oh, and Josh is actually called SMH stadium. <laughs> they went to the SMH stadium and lost 3 0 in front of 9K, 9,000 screaming fans, bearing for their blood, they're going for it. James Berry. Hasn't started in a while, popped up with a goal. Joe Quigley quietly plodding along, scoring his goals. Armando Dobra, another goal. 16 points clear, two games in hand. What can we say, guys? What are we saying? League, league's done, isn't it? Numbers don't lie. Numbers don't lie. It's over. Yeah, we need to get... I remember Clean might as well start tweeting. Um, what was that tweet? Uh, good luck catching them now. Yeah, tell tell Maka to start tweeting that man. All right, but Fem, let me ask you. Let me ask you a serious question. And I know we're competitors, and we've got we've all got ego. At what point was it over? What when did they win the league? Be honest. <laughs> Let's like, seriously speak. Josh, tell me when did they, when was it, it over? It, you know, it's never felt like it was actually on. If you go, I mean, like it's always been over. Like I swear, all I've ever seen is them like miles ahead. I can't remember a time when it was close. I swear to you, maybe the first ten games, maybe. I think they might have started on. They might have started on plus ten. That's no, it. because Barnet was on top. Yeah. When? Because I don't. Barnet was on top of the league for a second. Twenty twenty, bro. That, that... Bro, Barnet was on top of the. Remember, Barnet was on top of the league for at least the first ten games. Um, everyone I don't remember. That. That's what I'm saying. So it was the first ten games, and then after that, it like yeah, it was mad. They had everyone believing that it was actually going to be a close content. Yeah. They're actually taking a mick when I think about it. They're not, they're not, they're not playing fair, man. They're like the year 11s that take your ball when you're yeah. playing in the bar in, at lunchtime. And let me have a touch and just boot your ball away. That's what, it what kind of conversations they're having in their change room because they must be giggling to themselves. Because it's over, but you have to say the politically correct thing and say, oh, we're being professional to the end. Oh, we had Oli Banks on here. We had Oli Banks. Yeah. I, I know, I see that, and he's saying they've got to be professional. But I said to him, "Have you? I, do you know where you are going for your promotion?" He goes, "Nah, Jamba." But I know he's thinking in the back of his head, "Hey, listen, the <laughs> holidays are booked, the 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 champagnes on ice. Listen, it's it's all ready, man. Yeah. They've already planned their route for the um victory parade. Let's be honest. They've already planned their route. Um, but yeah. So and there's nothing. Let's, let's. It's just that in it. And and do you know what the worst thing is? Will Grigg didn't score, Mandeville didn't score, Oldacre didn't score. Yeah, it's just it seems, like, it seems like it seems like it's, it's just like the next pack scored after that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so there's there's the Griggs, there's the Banks and the Mandeville, but then the next pack after that is the Quigley. Oh, you don't you don't have a go today. You don't have a go today. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, it's, you got, it's just it's just it's just it's different. And they're locking down all their players. Shekhovic signed a new deal. Graham signed a new deal. It seems as though they're just... They're going about things. They're just preparing for next season, isn't it? Yeah. They're, they're, they're sorted. They're sorted for sure. What we, what we need to do is... Of course they've got the money. Of course they've got the infrastructure. They've got the players. But 
what we need to study is their style of play, um, their their leadership, and how they're putting these things together. Because let's be honest, confidence is a massive thing. And if you could bottle up confidence, if you could bottle up that feeling you had when you made your debut, it it would be easy, Josh. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. Josh, you said something about obviously um, you feel like in terms of style of football, you guys are top three. Where would you rank Chesterfield in that? Well, we played them in the first three games. Um, and obviously, they've changed a lot since then. Because like you said, Barnet were flying. But when we played them, we actually came off the pitch vex because we really dominated them. Like, really dominated. To the yeah. point uh, when we played Chesterfield. And even their... I, think, I don't think their manager did the team talk. It was the assistant. And he was like, we was lucky. He was like, we was really lucky. And they're really good. He was like, they're going to surprise a lot of teams this year. Um, so, like, obviously, based on that, but that was only three games in. Like, I was like, these, like, ain't good. I thought Rochdale were good. Um, but, obviously, as time's gone on, they've obviously maybe gelled, kicked, got into their stride, probably thought, oh, it's not as easy as we thought it was going to be, so let's turn it on a little bit. Yeah. And like you said, they've got, they've got so much depth that they can take a Grig out and Quigley will score. They can take... Uh, whoever's in midfield and put an old acre in and know that the standard is going to be the same, if not better at times, because they've got that much depth. Well, they all know. They all, when, when you're in a team that's gunning for it and going for it, you know that you want to be at, at the end of the season, you want to feel as though I contributed. So yeah. when you go in, there's a certain standard you've got to keep up. There's a certain level you've got to uphold. And what I love about them is they've got many styles of play. Yep. They don't just play from the back. They might kick it on time or they might not cross it in. They might play in and around the box. So they've got so many styles of play that um, I think that really makes them successful. Do you, never... feel, do you feel um, teams are fearing going to that stadium now? I don't know. Like, like you said, on it's going to be an ego because if you lot were playing on Saturday, because of the faith you have in yourself and the belief you have in your squad, for me, it's not a fear thing. Like, it, it's not because when I think about purely yeah. football... It's not everyone's how you are. Josh, you've, you're used to playing. Josh, you just told us you play in front of 60,000. So. Exactly. So you can't do that. You can't do that. And that's, what, um, and that's something I said to that's something I said to Femi. I said I said to Femi, sometimes how we how you think is not how everyone thinks. Your belief. Yeah. So when you're looking around the squad, Josh, and you're thinking, why are you... Uh, why are you struggling yeah. on the pressure in front of 500 people? That's because yeah. they're not used to it. That's because they ain't got that yeah. same mindset. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that. And to be fair, that's a good point because that probably was what factored in when we played Oldham early on in the season. You've gone from playing in front of seven, eight hundred, maybe a thousand, and then you go to Oldham and there's six, seven, eight, nine thousand, and you can't hear yourself talking on the pitch. You're trying to shout to someone to pass you the ball, and it's falling on deaf ears because the crowd are overwhelming you. So yeah, that's probably a, a good factor that when it's even when it's not weekly, it's easy to crumble under that pressure. But if you're playing in front of I don't know three thousand every week, then nine thousand seems like a lot. And when you're playing in front of and it keeps going up, so it kind of adds a bit of extra armor to your your show, if you get what I mean. Hundred percent. I've seen players crumble. We used to when I used to play for Wrexham, and there'll be regularly fans uh, numbers of. 4K, 5K, 1,000 fans. And you'd see teams come and crumble under that, you know? And there would be times where you can't hear yourself think. There will be times when you take a boggy touch and everyone gets on your back. And I've seen it. I've seen players will under that pressure. And that's the difference. That's yeah. the um, but then I, and then, but then I've seen players that grow in front of those capacities. So, yeah, those are the guys that go on to have the careers. But... Leaving your your uh, game to last, Josh. You played Ebbsfleet, maybe a bit of a six pointer. Mm -hmm. Ebbsfleet are down there as well. Um, was it your right back Andre Burley that scored the winner? Your right yep. back, right? yeah. I like Andre. I think he's a really good player. I, I, think, I think he's good, you know. Yeah, he's marking me at a corner. Um, really game up for the fight, um, and I, I was impressed with what I saw from him. Um, so talk to me. How did that game go? Did you play? How did you play? Um, and what and what you expect expected? Um, yeah, I played. Um, what I did well. 
I'm always going to say that. Um, I just know my strengths. I just know my strengths and I just play to them, especially in our team. Um, I know what I need to do for the team and I won't try and do anything other than that. I'm very straightforward with that. Um, we dominated the first half, like really dominated the first half. I don't think they had a shot on target all game. Not that I can remember. Actually, a free kick they had won. Um, second half, they kind of had to kind of come out pressing and with the high press and get in and amongst us. Um, it kind of played into our hands because it left me one-on-one -on -one with the centre-back all the time. Um, but they're, they're another funny team. They've got a lot of good players. When you think about it, like, they got Dom Polion, very experienced. Dom Samuel, very experienced. Like, they've got a good team. Luke O'Neill uh, played probably 300 games in the league. Obviously, Chris Solly didn't play yesterday, but they've got him. They've got Josh Wright. Like, like I said, this league's just crazy, but that's what makes it probably one of the most exciting leagues. Like, for me, it's it's the most I've enjoyed football because I, I never know what to expect. Like, for me, I wouldn't be surprised if we go and beat Chesterfield. But then Chesterfield go and turn over someone 6-0. Like, it, it just is what it is. But that game, um, it was a big game for us because all the teams around the bottom won. And I think if we would have lost that game, it would have really applied unnecessary pressure. Um, so thankfully we won that game, but now we've got two big games. We've got Kiddy next, I think. Then we've got Woken. So they're kind of, if we're going to stay up, which I firmly believe we will, um, we have to win those games. It's very rare because you guys are bottom of the league, but hearing you speak just then, you would never think you are. You'd never... I would have thought you was mid-table or, or gunning for some sort of um, promotion. So it's interesting. Where does that belief come from? Is it just in yourself or is it in your team or is it in your management? Um, it's partly in myself because when we lose, I I don't take it home with me, but I think to myself that I'm a difference maker. Okay. So I expect myself to be able to win a game or do something to win a game. So that's that. But then also in my team... We have a very small squad, a very, very small squad. There's only 16 of us. Right. Like, so, and a couple of them are kids. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, small budget. But when we have our full team, we could probably beat a lot of the teams, but we haven't had that all season. Zach was out for the first two, three months with, I think he was suffering with um, vertigo. So he couldn't, he couldn't run. He'd literally just pass out. Right. So he was out for three months. And then we had Josh Ashby, who's an amazing player, by the way, unbelievable player. Um, he then uh, tore his groin, so he was out for three months and the captain was out for two months. And there were long injuries that kind of hampered us. And we was having to bring players in on loan um, like the day before a game. Like yesterday, we didn't have a goalkeeper until Friday night. Because so Chris Haig is on loan from Ebbsfleet. Um, our, our number two had left the week before. And then they called him on Friday night saying, you haven't found a club yet, can you come play? Crazy. Like that is, but in terms of ability, you know what people like Zach and that are like, like probably one of the best players, for me, he's the best player in the league. I genuinely believe that. Like I've played with some good players and Zach McEachran would probably start in every team. I okay. think it's too easy for him. I, like, I've never seen someone get the ball in his own half and dribble three or four players. He's five foot six looks chubby, um, but just can move like I've never seen. Um, so now we're kind of getting those players back, but now Zach's injured again. So it's one of the ones where I just have faith in the quality that we have. Um, and I do genuinely think we will start to go on a run at the right time. Um, and it's not delusion or... Um, me trying to hype up anything. I just think we're too good not to go down. I think there's a lot of teams worse than us in the league. So so that leads me to my next question, Joshua, because this um, league is relentless. And mm -hmm. at the moment, obviously Oxford's one of the smaller clubs. The moment players at Oxford start doing well, they're going to get picked off. And it's happened with Sanderson. Sanderson's gone... Uh, really Sanderson. Uh, and I can imagine that there's going to be another four to five 
of you guys, including yourself, I personally think, um, that is going to get picked off end of end of season. Um, how do you think the manager is going to prepare for for what's coming? Because he knows it's coming. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's one of ones where even last season, the players had a lot of options. And I think it's strange and you're going to think like that doesn't make sense. But there's a good four or five of the core that have been there a long time. They're friends off of the pitch and they're just happy playing football. They Some of them don't have aspiration to go higher. It was only last season that um, I think Zach actually ever thought about leaving. Like ever, where he thought like, maybe I should go and test myself. Whereas if you ever meet Zach, most humble person ever, everyone's always telling him how good he is and everyone's like, who's that player? But he just kind of just just does it. He just turns up, walks around and then gets the ball and does magic. Um, same with the captain, same with Ashby, same with Canis. Like they've all had chances to go to bigger clubs um, and chose to stay. I think because they enjoy it. But now, like I said, football doesn't owe you anything. So it has to come to a point where you think, what can I take from it before it takes from me? I love that. I love that. Football doesn't owe you anything. And I think that's the perfect time to even go on to the advice of the young players. I know you've already touched on it, but obviously you was at QPR when they got promoted to the Premier League. Um, so a two-part question, really. Um, what stopped you from staying on at QPR when they... Um, what do you feel stopped you from staying on at QPR when they did get promoted? And also... What's the advice that you would give a younger you growing up, now that you are obviously the age you are? Um, so I think the one thing that stopped me saying on, obviously, turning that down that deal was stupid. I let someone make a decision on my behalf when I should have been capable of doing it myself. But obviously, we put our trust in people. Um, the second thing would have been ego. 100% ego um, because I felt like I was owed something or if someone gets injured I'm next in line that means you have to give me my chance I think a lot of young players it's worse now where young players um, have the biggest egos and you'd think that most players have played 500 games they taught you like it they've played 500 games um, yeah. but my advice would be kind of similar to what I touched on earlier on um Humble is not the right word because humble is having a low expectation of yourself or a low uh, a low thought of yourself. So humble is not the right word. Ego is good in the right regard because ego is um, thinking high of yourself. You should think high of yourself because you have all the capabilities to do everything. But advice to my younger self would be, um, like I said earlier, you're a person before you're a footballer. Um, and the person you are makes you the footballer you are. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, it's more so a case of be a good human, do the right things, like work hard. Like this, like we said, the basics. And that so will excel. Yours is not just only focus on football. Yours is more life. Yeah. So in, in, yeah, mine's to do with life because what you try, what you tend to find in football is uh, a lot of footballers think they are just a footballer and then they get lost in that football paradigm and it then kind of, the football becomes your life mm. and then your life affects your football, if that makes sense. It's really confusing, but... I understand this. I'm with you. I'm keeping up with you. Bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, so if okay. you actually just focus on yourself as a person, so like the your morals, like your, your hard work, your dedication, your manners, your um, how you treat people around the place that makes you a good footballer because it makes you a professional. It, mean, it, it means, here's the perfect way to put it, maintain your quality. So the highest version of yourself is almost perfection. When you come in the building, speak to people politely. Um, if you have a disagreement, speak about it in the office, not like me face to face. Um, if you want something, work hard for it. All of these things that are human traits, they're not footballer traits, they're human traits. And your human traits will make you a good footballer. I agree with you 100%. And this is what I've been preaching. You know, I feel like people just think football is like 
is a different type of like, area. Bro, it's life at the end of the day. It's still a job, you know. It's, football it's, is just a magnified it's, version. Football is just a magnified version of society. That's what, what it is. It's a magnified version of society. Yeah, it is. It is. But what I'm saying is that the principles like of a nine to five, where you do a nine to five job, or if you're a uh, um, uh, flipping accountant, the principles still apply in football. The same principles. I don't know why people think that it's a next sort of job or no, the same things apply. So everything you say. Exactly. So like that's why that's what I'd say to a young like young person. Um, be the best human you can be, and it will trans it will transfer into being the best footballer you can be. Hundred percent agree with that. I like that. Um, no, that's amazing. That's amazing to hear. And I love oh, on that on that point, sorry man, on that point, if you look at the the top, like the top like footballer, like you look at Mbappe or Kanti or you're around someone like Raheem Sterling or Bakayo, and guys are proper human beings, you know. Bro, that's why everyone yeah. loves. Uh, <laughs> Saka. I mean? That's why everyone loves Saka because they're like. He's actually a nice person. So they yeah. really, Bellingham. Look how viral that clip of him giving a cold little boy a blanket the other day. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it, it's it, beyond, it goes beyond football, and that's what I'm saying. A lot of footballers think they are just football, and then they have an identity crisis when football leaves them. Yeah. But it's an eventuality. Football's going to disappear from you one time. I don't so know. then, like, who am I? Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know when you said Bakayo. The first thing that popped in my head was when. Again, watching Captains. Anyone who's not watched Captains on Netflix needs to watch it. If you love football, that, that show is amazing. Um, but when he asked David Beckham for a picture, but the way he asked for it, it was how yeah. me and you would ask for it. And obviously he's a human being, but he was he literally said, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I was wondering if I could get a picture, please. It was like, but you're Bikai Sako. And it's like, you're just a nice boy. Before a footballer, you're just a nice human you know mm -hmm. um again Jude Bellingham I saw him pick up a goalkeeper's bottle placed exactly how he found it so little just the little things I, I totally agree with you I totally agree um but as I always say um my favorite part of this show is uh, the word of the week um a word that we us three can take into the week our followers our viewers our subscribers can take into the week whether they're having a good day or a bad day one word to get us through the week um, Fem, I'll let you go first. Josh, actually no, I'll, Josh will go first. I'll go last, and Femi, because this is your, this is your, uh, this is your world. We'll let you round it off. But um, yeah, Josh, start us off. God, put me on the spot. Or oh, do you need some time? Uh, you're good at this. This is going to be your bag. You're good at you've been you've been you've been rocking all day. You go, you go first. All right. Do you know what? I'll go. I'll go, and then Josh, I'll let you go second. So mine is care. And I say care because I think we really have to take care of ourselves um, and, and be very wary of when we're not feeling our best to maybe take some time out um, to look after ourselves, whether that's just having a quiet moment to yourself, going to the gym or um, talking, to, talking to a loved one, understanding your body, understanding your mind when you're not at 100%. You know? So um, that's something that I'm definitely going to take try and most of because I as I think I'm Iron Man and I'll yeah. run through anything and I'm I'm always on a hundred but I'm human isn't it we're all human so sometimes we've got to take our time with things and and take a moment to ourselves understand where we are you know so sometimes like my phone will be ringing and I just don't want to answer my phone I just want some alone time. I just don't want to be disturbed you know like Femi I'm not gonna lie you want to come over yesterday with, with Muzz I was tired I just wanted to be on my own Femi you know so Put it on screen. <laughs> say, that, say that again. You're putting it on screen. <laughs> no, because sometimes you want to be on my own, fam. You know, I, I need it. I need it. I need it to clear my head. I that, know, that fam. I know. I, 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 you know, fam. I always try and be there for you, but I need to be there for me. As <laughs> after a long, long week, Josh, I just needed some time for myself. So, yeah, yeah um, that's so. My, my word is care. Um, and Josh, I pass it on to you. Uh. I'm going to say kindness mm. because it doesn't cost you anything to be kind. It doesn't cost you anything to say thank you when someone opens a door. It doesn't cost you anything to ask anyone if they need a hand or 
ask a young boy if they need any advice or they want to stay out like kindness is massively overlooked undervalued um especially in today's society so yeah mine would be kindness like if you can move with that in the kind of forefront of your heart then i think you'll go a long way in football and life like i think it will take you a long way do you know what it's funny josh you've um on your instagram handle is the wounded healer yes we haven't touched on that <laughs> i'm glad you did touch tell, tell me a little bit more about where that wounded healer part comes from and, and why that's your so the reason for the wounded healer is it's not me it's you okay so people come to me because obviously i run my retreats and stuff um that i do like the wellness retreats that i run the off-grid uh wellness retreats etc um and people come to me thinking that i can heal them but i've got my own wounds so the fact that you're coming to me asking for help is actually healing a part of me because you think i have value to offer mm. which means that i'm doing work on myself that you see value in that so you're like josh eats really well or josh works out really well or josh is constantly in the gym i need to do that so then you come to me asking me to help you with that but in actual fact, you're helping me because you see value in the work that I'm doing just for myself. Mm. So everyone is the wounded healer. Femi, Femi and you are healing me now by allowing me to express myself. Mm. But you're wounded too. I like that. You say if I'm a wound, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm wounded. <laughs> nah, Josh, I'm wounded. <laughs> I'm wounded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're wounded for real, Josh. We're wounded for real. Oh, I'm scared up. <laughs> You're right. Yes, that's right. Fem, hit us. What's your word of the week? What's your word of the week? I'm definitely oh. going to teach you just about some meditation, and then we're definitely going to get onto that. Don't worry about that. But go on, Fem. My word of the week is um, emotions. Um, show no emotions, but embrace every single emotion. I don't want to go to people's heads. And what I mean by embrace every single emotion is because, and this is not me being negative, it's, 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 it's the bad or the, it's the bad emotions that propel you in life. So for example, if I, I didn't hate that job or if that manager didn't upset me, I wouldn't have left and gone to Charlton and got promoted to the championship, you know, in Josh's thing, you know, in Josh's story. And everyone has a similar story like that, but it's those bad emotions that that propel you. So embrace it. You know what I mean? If if I wasn't upset with my ex-girlfriend, I wouldn't have left her and I wouldn't be married now, living with my wife. Like, do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, it's those bad emotions. So don't run away from them. Don't suppress them. And even like when Ty got sent off um, yesterday, I said, Ty, go through it. Like, go through it. You know what I mean? Don't try and lie or suppress it. Go through the whole process. So, yeah, as well as well as we all want to be, we all want to be happy, we want to be full of joy and whatnot. Um, embrace, embrace the other harder times. Embrace those emotions. But those are the ones that are really going to cause a shift in, 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 in your life in the long run. Yep. I love that. I love that. So we've got care, kindness, and emotions. Those are maybe three of the most... Well, we've never had, we've never had ones like that before. I really like that. I really they're like all, that. They're all human traits. Yeah, trust, they're, they're pointing the ones. I like that. And even touching on time... Me and, me and Femi, Josh, we're like good cop, bad cop. <laughs> Most, I, I actually think our teammates probably at some point of the week definitely hate us because Femi was the good cop yesterday. I literally said, Ty, you're an idiot. But like, I've been in that situation, so I can say that. And I've known Ty for a good 10 years, so we've got that relationship. But when you get sent off like that, it's just, it's just mad. Like, do, you think that's me being, do you think that's me being a good cop telling him to go through it? Yeah. yeah it but, but I could have said... It's not that bad. I didn't tell him it's not that bad. But there's different variations of a good cop. Like you said, go through it. Whereas I said, like, yeah, you messed up, bro. Go through, go through it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you're right. It's good cop. I'm just telling him in a nice way. Like, yeah, 
Good cop always. Good cop always. Um, but that's why you're the club captain, fam, man. That's why. That's why they didn't give it to me because I can't. I can't do what you do. So, but yeah, that's those are the word of the week, um, and that's the episode, really. Uh, anything else you want to add, fam, or Josh? No, it's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure, and uh, it's very commendable what you two are doing. Like taking time out your Sunday to have honest conversations. Hats off. I appreciate that. And thank you for coming on and giving us your time. Um, this has been one of my favourite episodes for sure. And you can look back, I don't just say that. This is this is definitely one of my, my favourite episodes of knowledge. Um, I love how spiritual you are. That's something I'm trying to be more of this year. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on. Um, and I wish you the best to you and your family, beautiful family. Um, wish you the best, man. Thank you, my bro. Thank you. Gosh, this has been an awesome Sunday morning, you know. I must say. Look like at oh. like like uh, Honestly, I've got to thank you for, for because I'll be honest with you, I was tired. You saw before the, the thing started, I wasn't talking much. My body, my body's hurting, like, you know what I mean? But you got you guys, you guys got me through. Jamal as well, you got me through. But um, yeah, Josh, honestly, this conversation is an incredible one. You don't really have much of these conversations so when you do it's it's exciting and it you know what i mean and you learn a lot and i've definitely learned a lot from you uh, we need to connect away yeah. from this you know what i mean i feel like you've got a lot more a lot more a lot more about you that i want i want, I want to tap into i can't lie to you you guys would be there's a lot of stuff going on that I'm doing that you probably don't even know um, that we can speak about that is a byproduct of football that you lot would be amazing for, like to come and help out and all that good stuff. It's about making connections at the end of the day. And like I said, our intentions are good. So that's, that's what I said. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. Honestly, it's, it's, it's much appreciated. It's much appreciated. And thank everyone for tuning into another episode. Please like, subscribe, share. Let's just push this show as much as we can. Well, well what's that? Well, uh, f three quarters now, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's good. So, yeah, three quarters. So, yeah, we've, we've been there. We've been rocking. Thanks for rocking with us, everyone. For sure. for sure. Thank you for the watchers. Please like, subscribe, comment. We saw your messages on the Instagrams and the social medias as well. So, please continue. But as Femi said, this has been another episode of Beyond the 92. Thank you for watching. Goodbye from me.